go. <laughs> Gotta get these comments. Gotta get these comments. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> there we go. Do 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 do. Just getting everything set up here. Here 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 here. Yes yes yes. Got to click on myself a couple of times because I don't have a fancy high tech way of seeing all the comments other than just watching the stream. I am like you in that way. All right. Looks good enough to me. So, welcome. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to all people. I'm going to talk about music today. Um, you can maybe see in the background, I have a, I have a couple of things set up. Um, those of you just joining us, hello, my name is Danjo. Uh, I am the banjo player for this band called Gangsta Grass. Um, took last week off by accident. <laughs> Kind of forgot about it, but we had a lot going on then anyway. So I wanted to just uh, wanted to do that whole shut up and play something thing. So I'm gonna do that. Those of you wondering, I thought I knew what a banjo was. What's that funky little thing? This is, you're correct, this is not a banjo. This is a mandolin. This is my dad's mandolin. Um, I'm just borrowing it. That's a, that's a little tune that I wrote a few years ago uh, that I call Good Grief. Um, it's just a, just a fun thing I like to play. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, tunes, about fiddle tunes. This is not a fiddle. This is a mandolin. Um, 
but it's tuned the same as a fiddle, and so it's a, this is sort of the, the best instrument to play fiddle tunes on, with the exception of the fiddle itself, and I'm not very good at fiddle yet, um, but I can play mandolin. It's a little bit easier. It's got frets, um, and you know you pick it, and I know how to do that, and I grew up listening to my dad play mandolin anyway. We haven't had a fiddler in the family in like four generations, <laughs> so I'm hoping that uh, maybe maybe we've just given birth to one. We'll find out. It would it would really help us out around here. So we'll be sure to let them know that. Um, I'm I'm trying to learn the fiddle uh, recently, but uh, but as I say, I do play mandolin, um, and it's easy enough to play fiddle tunes on the mandolin. It's the same tuning. The notes are in the same place. It's the same same left hand fingering pretty much. You just don't have to be as quite as precise with it and you can pick it. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about fiddle tunes today, um, since they make up uh, so much of the backbone of bluegrass music, um, which is what I play. It's my contribution to this thing that is gangsta grass. Uh, I play bluegrass music. Bluegrass music was founded in large part on this uh, enormous tradition of fiddle tunes. Um, Coming from wherever, all over the all over the world, particularly from like the the British Isles, um, coming over from there, and uh, a lot of the old Celtic traditions. So you got uh, Celtic fiddle tunes come over to the states, and they end up in the Appalachian region where they're passed down on fiddle, and then you get a little bit more of the fiddle banjo uh, duet uh, with people playing claw hammer banjo and uh, yada yada yada, and that all turns into bluegrass. So, uh, I want to talk about the tunes themselves, and um, this might get a little bit wonky for people, so sorry if I lose anybody, um, but I wanted to talk about um, why, why it is fiddle tunes sound the way that they sound, which, uh, which sort of requires that we get a little bit into the language um, of these tunes. Um, and so, specifically, I just wanted to talk about the... Um, the melodic language um, and the scales, uh, the sets of notes that these tunes are made out of, um, and those scales, uh, a lot of them with these tunes, uh, we're dealing with um, scales that are called modes. Uh, and so this is this is maybe going to help out some of you who have been to um, some bluegrass jams, um, and you've heard somebody call a tune and. You might ask, all right, well, I don't know the tune, but I can sort of follow along. What key is it in? And uh, somebody might respond to that saying, well, it's in A or it's in D or whatever, but it's modal. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we're talking about a modal tune? Very simply put, uh, that's referring to uh, the tune being in a mode in one of these one of these scales one of these particularly restrictive uh, sets of notes that qualifies as a mode so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what is a mode for one thing and a little bit more involved what do we mean when we say that a tune is modal um, because it it it's kind of goes beyond whether whether it qualifies under a definition of, you know, happening to be all in a mode or not, um, it's we're we're trying to communicate something a little bit more than simply you know here are all the notes. Um, so if that sounds like your cup of tea, um, get um, we're we're here to drink that tea together. I guess. Good. That's out of the shot. All right. So, yeah, first of all, hello. How's everybody doing? It's Wednesday. It is Wednesday, my dudes. As the as the frog says in the meme, the meme where the frog says it is Wednesday, my dudes. I could probably just pull that up and flash it on the screen right now, but but I'm not I'm not doing fancy production stuff today. I'm doing this is music lecture. So, what's up? to John over on Facebook, Betty Lynn over on YouTube, what's up sleeves on the Twitch. Um, let's get into it. 
let's get into it. Um, try to balance this so I'm not just talking the whole time. Um, so maybe give you some tunes. Um, I don't know. Um, I'll tune. That is, and I happen to have my my Fiddler's Fake Book here. Um, I'm not always so good on the names of tunes. Partially, that's I think uh, a result of learning them in the oral tradition by ear. Not you know, I didn't learn almost any tunes out of this book. This is just this is a, mostly mostly I use it as a reference for the names of the tunes. And I'm pretty sure, <laughs> yeah, uh, this one that I just played is a tune called Red Haired Boy. And guess what? It is an Irish tune, if you if you couldn't have guessed. Uh, it appears under a couple of different names. This is actually a pretty useful historical resource, um, these fiddle tune books, um, which is it just reminds me how much learning music you really, you often get into so much more than just the music itself. Like that, I just played you some notes. But you look back, and there's history from different recordings. Uh, it appears as the red-headed Irishman. It appears on a couple of albums as Little Beggar Man um, from like Doc Watson and, and thereabouts. Um, obviously, delving into some uh, some interesting historical Irish stereotypes there. Um, and that is certainly not the most offensive thing that's documented in this book. There's there's some real history here. Um, things that have been amended. Over time, a lot of a lot of tune names. I mean, these are all you know. Bear in mind, these are all instrumental tunes. There's no lyrics, so at least not in this book. Um, there's no lyrics to be offensive, but you'd be surprised at some of these tune titles. Or maybe you wouldn't be surprised if you know the history of American music. Uh, anyways, that one uh, is a tune called "Red Haired Boy." Um, what's What's interesting to me about it? is it's actually, this is getting off topic, I guess, because it's it's not proving my point very helpfully. It's listed in the book, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, it's listed in the book as, as being in A major. Um, the way I played it just now, it was in A uh, mixolydian. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into a little bit of what all that means and what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, so I'm going to set this down and just... Just give you an idea of, uh, just give you an idea of, uh, this will be kind of some music, music 102 here. So if you've, if you've played an instrument and, uh, you have an idea of, you know, kind of where the notes are roughly, and maybe you've learned a couple of chords, maybe you've learned a couple of scales. Um, so you've, you've probably heard at least the terms thrown around like major and minor. Um, first of all, let me play you a little G major chord, uh, give you a sense of what that sounds like. Doesn't really sound like it's quite in tune, but a little bit better. I've noticed it's sometimes challenging to tune with headphones. That's about it. So there's your G major chord. Um, the way that we build chords, it's it's funny. A lot of people start learning music. If you're learning on like a guitar or something, you start with chords. But you really should start with scales, I think, because from a theory perspective, because we build chords using the notes in scales. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, let's take, for instance, a G major scale. So here's a G major scale. We got 
That's the fun thing about a mandolin. How how is it that one note could be out of tune with itself? Well, that's because mandolin has two strings. Uh, where where other instruments like a guitar would normally only have one string. So when you're playing a single note, you're you're actually playing two strings, and ideally they're in tune at least with each other, if nothing else. That's much better. So we get we get our G, uh, then A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. And G, there's your G major scale, um, and those are if you're familiar with the intervals, um, that's going to be a whole step, a whole step, a half step, a whole, a whole, a whole, and finally another half step. Um, but we can look at it another way, my favorite way, which is uh, we can break that all down into scale degrees. Um, now a G is a G is a G, all day long. Um, that's kind of a it's kind of a universal, uh, it's like an empirical value. Um, it has a particular frequency. Um, you know, a physicist could measure it and say, there you go, that's a G. The one above it is a G. The one above it is a G. Those are all Gs. Boom. Um, and so a G scale has to be a G followed by A, B, C, you know, in that order. Um, but if I were to play you, say, like a D major scale, um, looks very similar on this instrument, actually because it's all pretty symmetrical. So we would start off D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. So the notes are all, I, everything I just said with my voice, all different, right? The, you're starting on a D instead of a G, then an E instead of an A. Um, but the intervals are all the same, and the relationships are all the same. And this is one important thing about how you can, how you, how we can transpose things, how we can hear the same melody, uh, starting and ending in different places, as long as the shape of it overall is the same. We can recognize that, right? I mean, we're, we all do it all the time. Um, if you were to sing "Happy Birthday," um, you might start it off uh, on a G which means it's in the key of C. You might start it off, happy birthday to you, and then look around and realize, you know, actually that's maybe not the best key for everybody. People aren't really joining in. Maybe maybe let's start it on a C, so it's in the key of F. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Okay, so that's the same melody starting on a different note. And the way that we, the way that I like, I prefer to think of melodies then is less about, okay, happy birthday, how does that go? Well, starts on a G. Well, it doesn't always start on a G. You might not be doing it in the key of C, um, but it always starts on the, the five, the fifth scale degree of whatever scale of whatever key you're starting it in, okay? So let's take that G major scale again. That's a, starting on a G. So let's call the G one, right? Because that's where we're starting. Uh, if that's one, then the next note would be two, three, four, stop me if I'm going too fast, five, six, seven, and then at the top, since that's the G again, we're just going to go to one. So there's really only seven different notes. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. And we can use that same system wherever we're starting. As long as we're starting, you know, we choose a key and say we're in for instance, D. Okay, if we're in D, we're going to start on a D, and that means D is now 1. And if you remember a second ago, D was 5 because we were in G. We're not in G anymore. Now we're in D. So you got to be able to you got to be able to keep up. You got to be able to stay on your toes a little bit with um, you know, moving around between keys. And a lot of that, you know, figuring out, okay, what key am I in? You either ask somebody or check and see if it's written down. Or just, you know, you kind of, over time, you, you, learn to, you learn to figure it out with your ear a little bit. It can help. So, um, but let's say I'm telling you out loud, we're in D. Fantastic. So, so starting on a D, now D is 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1. And you'll notice if you can see all the frets, uh, you, you know, I'm skipping some of the notes because I'm skipping some of the frets. Uh, I'm using whole steps and half steps, so I'm not just doing, you know, first fret, second fret, you know, or zero fret, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then up. Um, I'm using scale degrees. 
So this is not like an instrument specific thing. This is the whole concept of the notes as we organize them in this Western system. Um, so what I've been working with here is a major scale. And that's kind of a good starting point because a lot of the way that we talk about music takes the major scale as a starting place, um, as sort of a default, and then moves beyond that um, by making alterations to that scale. So for instance, um, if we wanted to, if we wanted to make a scale minor instead of major, the way that we would do that, the, the main way, and there are several ways, but the one thing that all minor scales and minor chords have in common is the third note. Okay, so the third note on a major scale, we get one whole step up and then a whole step up. So there's the three. That's two whole steps higher than the one. And on a minor scale, you're going to lower that just by a half step or by a single fret. So it's going to be one, two, flat three. And we say flat three because, again, major is sort of the default. One, two, three is major. One, two, flat three would be your minor. And from there, we can build a couple of different scales. Um, notes that, that generally don't change in, in the most common scales are the one. Well, the one is just the one. There's, always a, there's never like a flat or a sharp one because the one is, everything's based off of it. But the four also rarely changes. The five also rarely changes. So the notes that do change are the three, can be a flat three, the six, which can also be a flat six, and the seven, which can also be a flat seven. And we can just really quickly, here's a couple of different scales um, that, that incorporate those different elements. We got one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven, one again. So this is gonna be one of those modes I'll get to in a second. So it's the flat three and the flat seven, but the natural or unchanged six. Um, let's try another one. One, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. That's, that's sort of the, the Carol of the Bells is the essence of this uh, uh, natural minor. The natural minor um, is sort of the most minor. Every, <laughs> everything that can be flatted or lowered has been lowered. One, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. Um, everything is just lower. Compare with major, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Everything is up, and then everything is lowered. Um, so those two, those two are among the most common. I think that you'll hear in just like music overall. Um, but let's uh, let's go through and identify these uh, these modes that we're talking about, so we can give some language to that, and uh, and then we can ultimately, finally, we're going to come around to what it means when we're talking about modal music, specifically in like a bluegrass or old time or Celtic traditional context, because, uh, because modal is a word that gets used a lot describing some of these tunes. So best way to do this, sort of a couple ways to do it. Um, we can listen to, we can look at each of these modes, um, and there really are only, commonly there are only seven, um, but ultimately you can kind of, I mean, there's whole books of, you know, people just like, but what if I did this? What if I combined these notes? Sure. But, but, uh, commonly, traditionally, we're really only working with, uh, seven modes. And even, you know, some of those are mostly theoretical. You don't have a whole lot of music based on some of them are, are, uh, I don't know. It's like saying, yeah, Antarctica is a continent. Okay. 
Good to know. Probably never gonna go there. <laughs> um, so some of these some of these modes are the Antarctica of 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 modes, um, but they all they all exist. They all exist. Um, and we can go through them one of one of two ways. We can either look at how they differ from from a major scale in terms of which notes have been lowered, um, which notes have been raised, because uh, a couple of them do that. Um, or we can do sort of another interesting thing. So I guess we'll do we'll do we'll do the first thing first, just to have gone through it, and then I want to kind of show you how this like easy way that you can generate all of them. Um, all right. So in, I guess, no particular order, um, there's a handful of modes that are major. There are a handful of modes that are more minor. Um, starting, let's start with the first one. Then this is part of why I wanted to talk about what are we talking about when we say modal, because after all, there's a lot of music out there that technically fits the definition of modal music. Um, but we would never call it modal music. And the best example of that is um, a, pr a lot of major music. Not all of it, but, I mean, basically all of it uh, is, is technically modal. Fits the definition of modal. Because the major scale is a mode. Um, I'm not going to remember all of them off the top of my head necessarily, because some of them are obscure, but the, the, and they all have Greek names. Um, so the major scale is referred to as the Ionian mode. Not something you'll need to know unless you plan on winning some trivia contests. Um, not something that's ever, ever going to come up at any jam, ever. Literally no one will say, let's play this one in the Ionian mode, because everyone's going to turn around and go, you mean major? And they will say, yes. I was just trying to be a wise guy. Uh, major scale. We already played it, but let's play it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. There's your Ionian mode. A um, couple other ones that are going to be pretty common. The Mixolydian mode. Mixolydian mode is major, one, two, three, four, five, six, with a flat seven. One. Um, the flat seven is common in a lot of blues music, so it's, it's sort of a step in the direction of what you could try to identify as like a blues scale. It is standing on its own. It's not what I would call a blues scale, but it goes in that direction. It's got, again, that flat seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Flat seven, one, is the Mixolydian mode. Um, another one that's interesting uh, and kind of major is the Lydian mode. Um, not totally uncommon. Um, mostly you'd hear it in... Well, let me play it for you, and then you think of where you might hear this. Lydian mode, one, two, three, raised four, sharp four, and then five, six, seven, one. I'll play that again. That's the Lydian mode. Um, if you're if you're familiar with, uh, there's a lot of like orchestral show tune, maybe TV theme song music. from West Side Story, although technically that's that's not actually in the Lydian mode. That's that's the four chord of of the ultimately the just just regular major. Anyway, um, but but the Simpsons theme definitely Lydian, and and a lot of uh, a lot of like uh, I don't know James Horner, Howard Shore, uh, uh, you know film scores from the '90s. Maybe starring Meg Ryan, you know, with like clouds, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Lydian mode. Again, not super common, but not unheard of. Okay, so those are really the three with, that you could call major just by virtue of them having that, uh, that regular, uh, that natural third degree. Uh, again, that's Ionian, Mixolydian. And Lydian. Um, then we 
we got seven, uh, seven total, so there's four more. Um, one I mentioned already, the natural minor. The rest of them are going to be uh, degrees of minor because they all have lowered uh, flat three degrees. Um, the Aeolian scale, or the Aeolian mode, is also known as the natural minor. Um, that is, again, one, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. Everything flat. Everything that would normally be flat is flat. Here's your Aeolian mode. Uh, three more, and here's here's one, actually, the one that I started in. No. No, the, well, I mentioned it earlier, anyway. Um, the one I mentioned earlier... Uh, where you have uh, a one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven, one. This is this is I would argue maybe the most com. It's a very common mode. A lot of the time when we say modal, I mean this is just kind of the TLDR. What do we mean when we say modal? Usually we mean it's in Dorian. It's in the Dorian mode. We just wanted to say it's modal. We just wanted to use a fancy term. But it's in, like, I don't know, 9 out of 10 times. This is a modal tune. Well, you probably are saying that because it's in Dorian. heard that you've definitely heard that if you listen to any celtic trad if you listen to any old time bluegrass gets into that sort of thing um and you know if you're listening to it chordally and we'll get more into chords in a second but if you're listening to it chordally you're this is going to be characterized by a minor one chord and a major four chord um which you can tell looking at the scale because the three is flat, right? So the three, which is the three of a one chord, but the six is not flat. And the six is the three of the four chord. Now we're getting into relative terms here, but you know, if we're in G minor or G Dorian, then the G is gonna be a minor chord and the C chord is gonna be a major chord, just based on the notes in that, in that mode. Um, so Dorian is Dorian is really where a lot of this whole modal thing comes in because again I've played for you a bunch of different scales here um, that people do not tend to typically use the word modal to describe even though they're all modes. Um, Dorian is really the one that I would say comes up most most often, and I think a lot of that is just the the fun tonality of mixing. Uh, mixing a minor chord and a major chord, minor tonality and major tonality, uh, in the same in the same mode, um, you know. And and it yeah, it's true that for instance, if you were to play uh, like a major song, um, you'd you'd have um, you'd have that's a better way to show that, um. You know, in a major song, like the one chord is major, and then the the six chord is minor. But um, no, that's not really a good example because like the six isn't as as common of a chord. Um, it's like if you had a if you had a scale where the one chord was major, and then the four chord was minor. You know, somehow, which I guess we could build that if we wanted to. Uh, Bear with me here, folks. We're just going to create our own mode for a second. Um, so if, okay, if the goal was to create a, a mode where the one is major and the, the one chord is major and the four chord is minor, all we'd really have to do is make sure that the three of the, the third degree of this, of this new mode scale is natural. And then the six is flatted, right? And then from there, we could pick whether we wanted a, uh, a um a rate a you know a regular natural seven or a flat seven um let's hear it both ways so one two three four five flat six flat seven one or one two three four five flat six natural seven one 
Um, that gap is a little bit weird. There's a bunch of scales that have that that um, flat six and regular natural seven. There's a bunch that do, but it's a little bit big. So maybe let's avoid that for a second. So this new the new Danjo mode is basically going to be a major version of the Aeolian mode, kind of. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, I'm sure that this particular, this is not even an uncommon set of notes. I'm sure there is a there is a body of theoretical analysis somewhere that already has a name for this. It already sounds very familiar in my ear. Um, you know, I'm not trying to discover anything new. I'm more trying to make the point that, you know, we can break down all of these different things uh, into their component pieces and put them back together again and, uh, and hopefully understand a little bit better how they work uh, and, and maybe where they all come from. Speaking of where they all come from, um, let me just get through all the rest of the of the <laughs> the weirdo modes um, in order of weirdness. So Dorian, again, one of the most common in terms of modal music. Um, we got we got two more, I think. One is uh, Phrygian mode. Phrygian is weird. Um, and the next one's weird too. Uh, so Phrygian, you have a one. You have a flat two, a flat three, four, five, um, flat six, flat seven, one. So in addition to, it's like Aeolian, right? Aeolian with a flat seven, flat six, flat three. And in addition to that, we have this flat two. You might be asking why at this point, and that's a great question. And I'm sort of about to get there. Sort of. Not really. Uh, but... Uh, um, but, uh, anyway, that's, that's Phrygian for you. Um, some of these less common modes, by the way, you will hear very intentionally in other genres of music. I'm not a big metalhead myself, but that stuff's definitely out there. Um, so last one, and then I'll show you something cool. Last one, we have Locrian. The Locrian mode, which is, uh, starts off, uh, starts off similarly. Uh, you got one, flat two, flat three, uh, four, and then, uh, flat five, uh, flat six, flat seven, one. I haven't played Locrian in a while. I'm pretty sure that's right. So that's what that sounds like. Uh, everything's flat. One, flat two, flat three. Four is like the only note that's not flat. Flat five, flat six, flat seven, one. Locrian mode. That's that you didn't know. That's what I was gonna be doing on on a Wednesday afternoon. Playing you the Locrian mode, but I did it. So, anyways, you got your you got your seven modes um, for extra credit. You got Ionian, Mixolydian, Lydian, uh, Aeolian, Dorian, Phrygian, Locrian. It's in no particular order. Sort of, sort of in order of, I don't know, complexity, usability, commonality. Um, so, so, let's, let's talk about that. Does anybody, by the way, did anybody have a, a particular favorite mode out of, uh, out of all of those that I just played? Favorite or, or, you know, mode, uh, mode I, I wish I'd like to hear more of, um, like a, like a missed connections mode. Uh, like, heard you on the subway 
the other day wanted to know if there were more tunes like you. Um, please respond. <laughs> um, yeah, pick one, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> Phrygian. Phrygian mode. Uh, P-H-R-Y-G-I-A-N. Phrygian. I lost a spelling bee once. Uh -huh. That's another story. So, so there's your seven modes. There's your, there's your seven modes. Um, the bells mode, the, the carol of the bells, uh, aeolian mode. Um, just your straight up natural minor. I say natural minor. Um, this is going to relate more to my later point, but I'll just cover it now. We have a couple of different minors. And when we're talking about uh, minor scales, this is much more in the Western classical and sort of chord, you know, uh, harmony theory uh, approach. But but just to touch on it, because we've done all these other scales, um, the natural minor is this uh, is this one two flat three four five flat six flat seven one. And the other two minors that are m most common in uh, Western classical music are going to be uh, uh, melodic minor, which is going to be one, two, flat, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Um, now it's called melodic. It basically just allows us to have this nice. Uh, it just it allows us with those those top four notes there or top five notes really uh, this nice melodic movement um, where we're able to play those uh, leading up to the one because um, that's kind of the heart of all Western theory classical theory is that uh, you have this tension uh, introduced by the dominant chord the five chord um, heightened usually with the dominant seven. With, which creates a distance between the uh, the seven and the three of that chord that resolves outward uh, when when the five chord resolves to the one chord either to a major chord or a minor chord doesn't really matter um, and you hear it in in melody voice leading too you can hear things like uh, when when somebody sits on the on the seven on that you know penultimate note there. Right, this is it, a lot of it. Just is about creating that simple tension and resolving. It. Now that note on its own doesn't really create tension unless we give it a little bit of context. So in a in a chordal context, that's kind of what helps. Or if you approach it from other notes, right? Uh, uh, so again, you know, a lot of it is psychological. A lot of it is just the context that we give it. So melodic minor has to do with that. Um, that, uh, that nice melodic uh, voice leading ability. And then harmonic minor, which is a weird one. It's got that gap in it. It's got one, two, flat, three, four, five, flat, six, but natural seven, and one. So you've got a, you've got a big gap between flat six Natural seventh one, not something that you hear a lot in in Western classical melodic writing, right? You don't hear a lot of Western classical unless it's trying to be trying to like reference the exotic or something. Which you do hear a lot of that sort of thing. Of like, I went to India and I heard a thing, and now I'm writing a a symphony, um, which you know has its own whole history. I mean, like any other art form, there's always uh, there's always elements of that, um, definitely in classical music. But most of the time, you don't really hear a lot of intentional in Western classical music. No, this is not so much about um, melodic writing. This is more about those chords. Remember I was talking about how, for instance, the Dorian mode has a minor one chord, but a major four chord. Similarly, the harmonic minor uh, scale allows us to... Um, uh, allows us to tune our instruments.
This mandolin does not get a lot of love from me, and I need to I need to change that. It's not gonna grow up big and strong. <laughs> uh, um, so, like with the the Dorian mode, where you get an interesting combination of chords facilitated by the notes in the scale. With the harmonic minor, you also get an interesting combination of chords. Uh, namely, you get your minor one chord, you get your minor four chord, right, with that lowered six, and you get uh, a major five chord. And the major five chord is really important harmonically, hence harmonic minor, because it pushes to, in the Western classical convention, the one chord. In this case, the minor one chord. But um, So that's the reason that the harmonic minor scale is put together so weird. It's not designed to make nice melodies. It's designed to make nice chord progressions. And that, that concept will kind of come back a little bit, um, I think, when we talk about modal music and kind of kind of come back around to resolve um to resolve what we're uh what we're talking about here again the fundamental if you just tuned in boy uh i'm not gonna go back too much but well i'm sort of i'm about to go back i'm actually gonna play all the modes again that i was just talking about we've been talking about modal music uh talking about uh the modes the scales that are the modes uh how they all work how they're different um Strengths and weaknesses, likes and dislikes, long walks on the beach, and um, and ultimately how that all applies to bluegrass music and the various folk music that feed into bluegrass. So, um, what I'm first going to do, this is just kind of to cap off all the stuff about the, all the different modes, show you something nifty, which is the easy way to generate all seven modes real quick without having to think about flat this, flat that, raised whatever. And the easy way to kind of keep them in order and remember which one is which. Very easy trick. All you have to know is major scale. That's all you have to know. You gotta know one scale. Because if you start with the major scale, in this case G major, right? And you say, all right, here's the one. G is one. So you get G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. The way, and then remember, that is already one of your seven modes. So you're already, you're already on, off to a great start. So that's your Ionian mode, the major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. If we wanted, we could generate then a Dorian mode really easily. All we would have to do is if we're pl already playing the G major scale, we play it again. This time, we're going to start and end on the second degree of that scale, which in this case is A. Now, we're not going to play an A major scale, right? A major scale. No, no. We're sticking with the notes in the G major scale. That is G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. But we're going to start and end on the A, which is going to give us A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A. Or in other words, one of this new scale, one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven, one, also known as the Dorian mode. So we just generated a mode based on the major scale, which I think is initially where this even conceptually comes from, um, that, that ideally these, these modes are actually all modes of, uh, of this same scale. So we're going to keep going through. We'll find if we, if we take these, this pitch set, take the notes in this G major scale, and we start on a different note. We start on the 3, or the, the B. We're going to get Phrygian mode. If we start on the four, we're going to get Lydian mode. If 
we start on the five, we get Mixolydian mode. And Mixolydian, I think I mentioned earlier, has that flat seven, and so it ends up sounding kind of like the scale of a dominant seven chord. Um, so you hear Mixolydian sort of in those in uh, in a lot of blues influenced music. That's, you know, Mixolydian, I think, also falls into the basket of, of modal modes. Uh, when, when we're talking about bluegrass music specifically, and somebody says this is a modal tune, chances are also pretty good that it's in, that it's, uh, in a Mixolydian mode. Um, but again, most of the time, Dorian. Some of the time, Mixolydian. Uh, keep going, and we can hit, uh, we can make a scale out of the sixth degree. We get that natural minor, also known as the Aeolian mode, again. Uh, um, Aeolian mode, and then finally, if we were to start a start a G major scale or any major scale on the seventh degree we would get we would get up up locrian mode which is a weird one and really unstable because it's got it's the only one, it's the only mode with a, that doesn't have a perfect fifth. It's got a flat five in it. And it just, that's kind of at the heart of Western music, at least Western classical theory. That relationship, that tritone, that flat fifth, uh, really, really wants to resolve. Resolve either uh, inward or, uh, or uh, outward. So here we're, we're starting to mix a couple of different languages together. Now, I didn't script this at all, and it's all segueing very smoothly, so uh, great job, me. I should probably take a water break. <laughs> um, we're starting to mix a couple of different languages. Um, we've got this uh, really older, um, simpler language of these modes, and then we've got this, mo and the modes are really very melodic driven very much just like here's a pitch set here's a melody you build out of them that's it the four chord what's a four chord a lot of these fiddle tunes really weren't written or designed with chords in mind and that's important to keep in mind that when you hear a fiddle tune and it has chords those chords as often as not were written by someone else you know who not the person who wrote the tune originally those chords were added as a harmonization um, so that a band can play it, you know, somebody can play guitar um, and play chords on the guitar. Uh, but a lot of the old stuff, if you don't hear a chord instrument providing rhythm, uh, that's how that's how it started. That's how it was intended originally. It was just a melody, and you hear like ten or fifteen session players all playing the melody at the same time, the same way. That's because that's how it was. Um, not right or wrong. It's just that's how it was, and the chords were added. A lot of the time so um, so we're really combining different languages here when we when we start to get into uh, harmony um, and uh, you know chord progressions and music theory in that way um, so I want to play <laughs> um, let's see I think uh, 
probably Jerusalem Ridge might be a good example. Um, You know, it's not even really a good example on its own because the melody doesn't really change to imply anything. But just typically, when you're when you're playing it chordally, um, chordally, there's a something that might not even really be the best example on my own. I might need a an accompaniment player to add the context, which is really kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, the, the general point here is that, like, a lot of these tunes really don't uh, get into um, that, like, Western classical language at all. Let me see if I can think of one that, um, off the top of my head, I don't want to have to read one out of the book, but, um, but, uh, yeah. Because there really, there really aren't a lot of fiddle tunes that, if you were to, if you were to hear a fiddle tune, do this kind of um, harmonic minor sort of sounding thing, um, where it were to go, you know, um, where it goes, you know, like natural minor on the way up, and then changes to melodic minor um that's that's a very western classical thing the idea of we're going to you know momentarily shift the pitch set that we're using to serve the 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 harmonic language and framework and context uh, that's all natural minor and then getting into melodic minor right that kind of change you don't really hear that specific kind of change in a lot of fiddle tunes unless they're maybe, you know, English or uh, maybe maybe French or, you know, coming from uh, places where there's really maybe more of a classical influence or depending on what the composer was thinking about. Um, but the, the, the Celtic trad stuff, like the Irish and Scottish stuff, you really don't hear as much of that kind of... Um, that kind of like especially that you know especially like in a what we're really talking about specifically i don't know if i've made this point clearly enough but in a in a minor key if we have that minor one chord or minor you know that flat three note in the scale to then combine that with pretty much the the you know the the dominant seven five chord um that that raised that natural seven degree in the scale that's that's a that's a decently uncommon thing in in bluegrass you know old uh traditional fiddle tunes that influence bluegrass so i'm i'm more talking about what modal isn't than what modal is so what are we talking about when we talk about uh identifying something as modal um so let's look again at um, uh, here's so here's Salt River. Um, this is in in A, by the way. Um, so it starts out uh, up, going up to the one, up to the four, and then introduces that flat seven. lines i don't remember the exact how it's notated in the thing um but the point is it it stays it's it introduces that flat seven and it doesn't resolve it at the end like if if it were if this were say a um in like a i don't know being cited in like a symphony you might expect it to do something like Right, get that little, get that little natural seven right before it pushes to the uh, to the one. Reason for that would be 
to get a major five chord to resolve to a to a one chord. And it doesn't do that. And so a lot of what we're talking about here, knowing all these modes and everything, knowing all the different pitch sets, is fine and good. But what we're really talking about is we're we're talking as much about what a tune doesn't do as what it does do, if that makes sense. Um, so what it's not doing, again, is resolving... into something that Beethoven or Haydn or Bach could have written, right? We're not doing that. So, so really when somebody says this tune is modal, they're partially calling it out for the people playing the melody. They're also a lot of it that's calling out to the people playing the chords. They're indicating to the people who are playing the chords, look, a lot of this bluegrass stuff is, is sort of, you know, American pop derived, and so it's going to have... Uh, a major five chord that goes to a one chord. That's pretty much the convention in the genre of music. But when we're playing fiddle tunes, it's kind of just a reminder of, hey, don't just default to... You know, it's not all going to be major five to one. Um, and in specifically, it's not really right now. Right now for this tune, don't, don't do that. And pay attention to the notes... Pay attention to, you know, what mode we're in here. Um, so a lot of it ends up boiling down to don't default to playing, if we're in a major key, for instance, don't default to playing the five chord as major. Um, so mostly, mostly if you're saying modal, you're saying, okay, the seven is probably flatted. Um, you may also be saying, for instance, if it's a if it's a minor tune, if it's a minor tune, it might be in Dorian, which is a, a, again an unusual mode, right? So that tune I was just playing was in Mixolydian, which is major but with a flat seven. Dorian, if you hear something in minor, you might go on to think, okay, it's in minor, it's in natural minor. No, not in this case, right? Somebody says, okay, well, it's in, uh, it's in D minor. It's modal, though. Okay, so probably what they're implying here, and you'll find out when you hear the tune, what they might be saying is it's in Dorian. Um, there wouldn't really be any reason to say it's, you know, that Aeolian is modal, other than that it never goes to a, a major five chord. Um, but if it's Dorian, saying it's modal... Contextually here, what we're saying is one, two, flat, three, four, five. That six is not flat, and you might expect it to be flat if it were a natural minor. Instead, it's... Uh, and so again, that really applies very much to the anybody playing chordal accompaniment, because then they should know that they're playing... Um, they're playing, uh, uh, where's a D minor? So they're playing the one chord as a minor chord, and then the four chord as a major chord, as opposed to a minor four chord. So again, it's, it, we're really talking about what not to do, and kind of just, you know, listen for a second and make sure, make sure as always, make sure what you're doing uh, actually fits with what's going on around you. So that's that's really pretty much it, honestly. And I got it. I got that in in just about an hour. Um, so good job, me. Uh, but that's that's basically the point that I wanted to make. What are we saying when we say let's play? Um, uh, let's play June Apple. Um, um, let's play June Apple. It's in A. It's modal. Um, what we're saying is partially to do with what it is. 
which is that it's constrained to a particular mode, a particular pitch set, um, in this case, uh, Mixolydian. But what we're also saying is what it's not, which is, um, which is, it's not going to follow those those classic Western rules of of chord harmony and progression. Um, and again, I'm sort of, you know, uh, doing like bastardized versions of these tunes to give you an idea of what what would it sound like if June Apple were not modal. Uh, Yeah. That that kind of thing, I guess. <laughs> you know, not flat seven, uh, and it it ends up just feeling kind of weird because um, that's not how the tune goes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you can you can transpose anything kind of pretty much. Um, but what we're ultimately doing is we're avoiding that situation where we're, you know, moving melody notes around in order to make chords work. Um, because that's, that's, that's kind of the fundamental distinction between, um, you know, traditional fiddle tunes and Western classical theory is with the traditional fiddle tunes, the melody really dictates and drives and, and is in many cases, the only thing, uh, there is no chord. Uh, for a lot of fiddle tunes, unless you make one up and add it. Um, and in that case, the melody really should be driving what the chords are. Whereas in in Western classical music, a lot of what's going on is dictated by uh, the rules of chordal harmony. Um, so that's, you know, that, and that's kind of when I think about it, that's kind of one of the things about bluegrass that I love so much. Because bluegrass music is really a a a nexus point, you know, a synthesis um, of all of that stuff. Uh, you you have you have a lot of you know I'm not saying Western classical influence in bluegrass directly, but you do have a lot of popular American music influence. And after all, popular American music derives from you know early 20th century Tin Pan Alley, you know. Uh, and that, you know, early jazz stuff, and that really derives from popular song in the in the 19th century, and a lot of that ultimately does go back to European classical music. Not all of it, uh, but a lot of that particular influence uh, comes from there, and then you have that combining with uh, the fiddle tunes. And then you have also all of that combining with the undeniable influence of, of black music, of black popular American music, of African music, you know, there's just so much of, of New Orleans jazz, there's so much going into bluegrass, um, and it really should all be acknowledged and kind of, kind of gone into, you know, with an awareness, like you should be aware of all this stuff, because, because a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's compatible, but sometimes you have to make choices, sometimes you have to say, okay, well, is it going to be, you know, flat seven or, or, uh, or natural seven? Well, that kind of that that could be kind of a heavy question. It's like you know, what flavor icing do you want on the cake? Well, that depends. Are you trying to honor your Celtic traditional roots here? Or are you trying to establish a more you know Western classical conventional uh, harmony thing? Um, oh, Pharaoh's calling. Kind of, I kind of wish I could pick up this call and just talk to him, uh, but I don't think it would come through on the thing. I'll talk to him later. If I can't talk now, I'm streaming. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll talk to him later. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, I think that, uh, I think that pretty much makes my point. Um, does anybody, anybody have any particular favorite modal fiddle tunes or, or just favorite tunes in general. Um, any, any, any music theory questions? I know you've just been, been sitting on them for, for weeks and months and you've, you've always wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask, but I'm here today, today and today only to tell you, you can ask me all, all those burning questions about music theory. Cause I just, 
I just love it. And, and in saying that, you know, I don't want you to feel like, well, I don't have any of this knowledge or, or vocabulary. I don't have formal training and I don't know what an Aeolian is as opposed to a Stygian. Um, so I, I don't even know how to ask this question. Totally fair. Totally fair. And after all, a lot of music theory is really just about applying, you know, sort of random arbitrary rules and terminology to the phenomenon that we know is music, which we don't even have a, a great working definition of what music is. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I'm, most of the questions that you might ask, I'm probably just going to be like, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> if that's how it makes you feel, you know, like, why, why, why do I like this song? Man, I don't know. Um, but I guess if you had a question like, how come this song always reminds me of that song? Then I might be like, oh yeah, that's because in the middle of this song, the fiddle player, you know, starts to, starts to reference like a completely different tonal language. And so, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of great performances, a lot of great, like, you know, live performances of songs, like you'd have... Uh, you know, Bill Monroe would, would incorporate like fiddle tunes, old, old, old time fiddle tunes into his like new bluegrass songs, especially if it was a song about a tune or a song about a fiddle player, a song like Uncle Penn, like, hey, here's my Uncle Penn and he plays fiddle tunes. Here's some of the fiddle tunes. Okay, now back to singing about him, you know, um, or a uh, great Steve Earle song, Galway Girl, you know, you've got a this tune that I'm pretty sure is just written for the, like, it sounds like an old Irish Celtic tune. I'm pretty sure though, it's just part of the song, but he, he works it in really well as here's, um, you know, this song, um, uh, I don't know any of the words. And I took her hand and I gave it a twirl. And I fell in love with the Galway girl, is, is how the song goes. And then in the middle of it, he works in this tune. And I'm pretty sure, I don't, I don't know it, I haven't found it anywhere, so maybe it is a pre-existing tune that he just stole and wrote the song around it. But I could easily believe that he also just wrote that tune to sound like sort of this traditional Celtic version of the song, you know, which either way, like I would do that. I would proudly do that. What a great move if that's what it is. And if, you know, if he just took an old tune and just wrote a song around it, that's cool too. That's cool too. Because, because a lot of this stuff is, is just, you know, this meeting of different, different musical languages. Uh, sorry, somebody had a question. Oh yeah. Uh, in the jailhouse now. Um, <clears throat> Unclear. Yeah. Are you actually in the jailhouse now? Or are you saying that you like that song? I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Musically, the, the, the thing about in the jailhouse now that is interesting to me um, is not really about the chordal or melodic language. Uh, it's really all about uh, it's really all about the the timing, uh, the rhythm. Uh, not really the time, the rhythm so much as the structure. Uh, all right, so, <clears throat> so chords are chords are really straightforward. Um, it's all just one, da -da 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 -da, one, da -da 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 -da. um, a one, um, uh, uh, dominant, you know, one flat seven, uh. Four. Um, so this is actually going back to that like earlier 20th century um, uh, harmonic language where you have the the dominant one leading to the four and then similarly uh, the two um, or dominant two or five of five right dominant two resolving to the five and a little secondary dominant motion there very common in classical music <laughs> uh, and then the chorus is he's in the jailhouse now he's in the jailhouse now 
one to four. Do, 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 do. This is all over the five. Five, 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 five. Da, 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 da. Um, I have a little bit of a cold, so I will not attempt yodeling, I don't think. Um, nope, no, it's not there today. Um, but, but yeah, it's a great tune. Um, um, I had a friend named Ramblin' Bob. He used to steal, cheat, gamble, and rob. He thought he was the smartest guy around. I found out last Monday Bob got locked up Sunday They got him in the jailhouse way downtown He's in the jailhouse now He's in the jailhouse now Well, I told him once or twice Stop playing the cards and shooting dice He's in the jailhouse now yeah, it's a it's a fun it's a fun chorus. Um, the the timing on the verse is pretty straightforward, um, but on that chorus, there's just that little extra time um, that you really want to. Uh, somebody actually called that at a jam at a jam class that I was leading once, and I was like, "All right, this will be a good learning opportunity uh, because because you're really gonna have to. You can't just count it and." think it's all binary and it's all twos and fours you're really gonna have to follow me um if you don't know the song uh because that last little line there um you'd expect it if it's if it's all you know binary you know it's going to be like two bars of one is in the jailhouse one two three four two two three four and then go to the four one two three four two two three and then the five, a one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, one. That's not how it goes. There's an extra <clears throat> bar or two. I don't know once or twice, playing the card, I shooting things. <coughs> so that's, yeah, you get one extra bar with a stop. And that's, uh, that's how that goes. It's a great one though. It's a really it's a really good especially with the with the yodel section in there, which you can pretty much stretch out however you want. Uh you know, you can just hold that, you know, do your do your most effective yodel. And then you have to give a little cue for the chord changes. The yodels, I mean, the yodels are great. The yodels are, I would argue, yodels are kind of, the way that they're applied in like old proto-bluegrass, <clears throat> Jimmy Rogers stuff, it's really a, kind of a, a like a, a, a harken back to like a cadenza in old uh, Western classical music. And that's probably going to be the last tie in that I have time for. Um, once again, this has been Modal Music on a Wednesday. I'm Danjo. And uh, if you have any more nerdy music questions, um, let me know. Let me know for next time. And uh, I'll be back in two weeks.